were you 100% work from the office before the pandemic? Were you 80%? Where were you? And then how do you think about it as the CEO of a, you said a thousand person company? How do you think about it? Because your well, employees are listening now. I'm, yeah, <laughs> no, I know. In your opinion. <laughs> I hope they are. Um, mostly we worked from an office. Yeah. And I've had time to reflect on how much of that was my own ego the feeling that I got when I walked into the office and seeing everyone working hard and feeling the buzz of the culture, how important was that to me? Um, one of the reasons that I got involved with startups almost right out of college was because there was this huge hole in my life. I missed the dorm. I missed the sense of purpose that I had as an idealistic college student. And I found it again in working 24 seven with other entrepreneurial people, first to build plum tree software and yep. later to build Redfin. And so I really wanted us to all be together. And I still think that there is a living death doing one zoom after another. Um, I sometimes feel like a zombie, um, but That's I also cool. know that cracking the whip and just making people come in when they have to commute 70 or 80 minutes to get to the office. It ain't worth it. And what you have because of a housing crisis, every employer is going through this is people say, especially when they work at a housing company like Redfin, I'm a software engineer, I'm a highly paid professional, and yet I still don't make enough to buy a house in one of the core parts of the city. And when they say, what I'm gonna do is work remotely, you don't have to give me a raise. I'm moving to Nebraska and suddenly my wife can actually stop working or my husband can stop working because one income is going to be enough to pay the bills on a $250,000 house. All you feel is relief. You don't try to tackle them and say, you've got to stay in Seattle. You feel relieved. And our challenge had been that we have a San Francisco office and a Seattle office. And we always wanted people to move to the San Francisco office because the home office with Seattle was easier for us to recruit there. And so some people would want to do that, especially younger folks. San Francisco is so beautiful. But then when they went down there, even though we were offering to pay them 50 or 60 percent more, they'd say it's not worth it because they tore homes over the weekend and say, I'm not yep. going to move into that shoebox. So we have had you know, a slow migration and America had had a slow migration out of these major urban centers for a long time, the pandemic was just the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, people have been it leaving California for five years right? before. Like, it feels to me massively, like the pandemic yes. is this massive accelerant because we were already having this conversation and employees come to us and say, hey, can I stay where I am? I'm like a top tier employee. I yeah. might leave if you don't. Yeah. It was like this negotiation. Now it's like the balance of power. I don't know if you saw Apple folded, Netflix folded, Everybody's basically yeah. folded and just said, you know what? Okay, do what you want. As long as the ball keeps moving forward, what have we lost? Because some of the things in coming to an office, uh, you know, the esprit de corps and the and, and the energy yeah. was palatable. So for everything that is gained, getting rid of the commute, mm -hmm. um, all of that seems amazing. And I think it's probably, I don't know what percentage, great and upside, mm -hmm. but what is lost? And then what percentage is you know, in this trade-off in your mind? Is it 80% good, 20% downside, or all upside? What do you think? Um, I think it's on balance good. It's definitely on balance good for the employee, especially if you have a family. I think no it doubt. hurts new hires um, who are just trying to learn the lay of the land, especially if you're younger and you don't already have a network of friends and family in town. There was this time when work, especially at a startup, was almost like going to a church. The people met their friends that way. They met their spouse that way. They got their sense of purpose in life from that office. And now it's all being mediated through this screen. And that is definitely a, a downgrade. Yeah. 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 So I think in general, work has become less important for Americans. And what's been hard for me is that I was never wow. the smartest entrepreneur in the world. I was just the hardest working one. So somebody else would figure something out in 30 minutes, but I was same, willing to be there same. all night to grind it out. And if you develop that blue collar ethic generally across the company that we're just going to have to work a little harder to deliver more value for our customers, it doesn't quite square with the labor shortage that we now have, the remote work liberation that we've all gone through. I have lunch with my kids and I'm still a driven nut job. 
I work yeah. all the time. You were asking me about my vacation. And it's yeah. just this anxiety that I'm not a good enough CEO to slack off. So I need to figure that out. And I think Silicon I'm Valley... I'm trying to figure that same thing out. Yeah. But So tell me where you are in this, because it there is also... You and I are both Gen Xers. Yeah. We were raised with like, well, maybe we could take over the system and we could be in charge and we could start our own things. Yeah. And now this yeah. seems like this is other generation who's like, why would you want to give that up when you could become a freelancer and take six months off and YOLO yeah. and go to Coachella yeah. both weekends? And, and we're trying to manage a workforce that now is disconnected from yeah. what we wanted from our lives. They want something different, it seems. Work-life balance, I guess, is how most people say it. So do you think it's yeah. generational? Because that's kind of my thought here is like when I hear work-life balance, I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't understand. You know, Jason, you're talking about, I love what I do. Why would I want balance? I love this. Well, have you ever read, I know this is a bizarre reference, but there was this, I think, 10th or 11th century monk, the Venerable Bede. And I remember reading him in college. He said that the monks now in, you know, 1050 are so much worse than the monks in 1030. And I was like, oh, please, all of you were very religious and very devoted. And so I try to avoid the crankiness that one generation is lazy and another generation isn't. But I do think that I do think that for me, um, I've needed a calling that in between Plumtree and Redfin, Plumtree went public. I made plenty of money. I could have gone anywhere in the world and learned kite surfing or sat on a beach in Costa Rica And what I really wanted to do was to make a difference in my life. You referenced at the beginning of the show that I had this crisis of conscience where I almost became a doctor, which would have been the worst thing that could have ever happened to me because it is so rules driven and narrow in some ways and so good in other ways. But I just had to be free and creative, but I still had to figure out a way that I could make a difference. And I'm not sure that speaks to everyone in the same way. Um, You know, some people feel that in joining a company and signing up for a mission, they're just giving up their freedom. And so there's always going to be that group of folks who want more degrees of freedom, who want less meaning out of their work and just more time to spend on their hobbies. And then I think there are going to be those special little freaks who I still want to gather around me who really want to change the world and are willing to put their shoulders to the wheel and work together with other folks to do that. And, and, yeah. I don't know how else to change the world. I don't think you can just do it by yourself four hours a day, contracting and dialing in. Teams today need a central hub for their information and work more than ever, especially in a world of remote work. That's where Notion comes in. It's one place for notes, docs, projects, and everyday work that goes way beyond a wiki. When we went fully remote back in March of 2020, when the pandemic started, Notion became our internal knowledge bank. Here is one of my producers going through our pod notes page on Notion, where we highlight the top lessons in every episode. And it makes it really easy for us to edit these, get up and running and share that knowledge. Notion is the one place where every team from engineering to sales can work together seamlessly with 500 integrated apps, including, of course, Google and Slack, collaborate in real time and tailor workflows to your needs. Hundreds of thousands of teams worldwide are already delighting their employees with Notion. Notion has a worldwide community of millions of users creating templates and tutorials, so the product is continuously improving. Now, every part of our group, from the investment side, diligence when we do an investment, to the podcast, booking guests, and pre-production, plus post-production and marketing, all done with checklists. We keep them on Notion to make sure everything gets done, and they got comments on Notion. It's such a great product. Go to Notion.so and use the promo code TWIST to get $250 off the annual team plan. That's incredibly generous. That's a couple of months free, actually, for your growing team. So go ahead and go to Notion.so and use the promo code TWIST at checkout for $250 off. Nicely done, Notion. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. 